I think the turning point for me, uh, Hank, was uh, as a kid growing up on a farm which was both a beef and dairy property in this country. My father turned around to me one day when he was sitting on a horse next to me and sitting on a little horse, a pony. And he said, have you made up your mind, Kev? And to which I thought, what do you mean, Dad? I was about nine years old. He said, no, the big decision in life. And I said, Dad, I don't know what you mean. He said, are you going to have a future in beef or dairy? <laughs> um, democracies are like the political equivalent of automatic stabilizers in an economy. So you've been to hell and back in the last four years, but the stabilizers have kicked in and the American people have decided on a new course and your friends and allies think this is, as we'd say in Australia, a bloody good thing. Welcome to Straight Talk a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Kevin Rudd. Kevin was recently named as a new president and CEO of the Asia Society after serving as president of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Previously, he served as the 26th Prime Minister of Australia and as Foreign Minister. He led Australia's response during the global financial crisis and helped shape the global recovery through his leadership in the G20. Kevin is a distinguished China scholar and leading voice on Asian affairs. Kevin, welcome to the podcast and congratulations on the new job. I can't think of anyone more qualified to lead the Asian society into the next chapter. It was my great privilege to work with you when we were both in government, and it's not every day we get to learn from someone who is a prime minister and a China scholar. So let's start at the beginning. You grew up on a small town farm in Queensland, Australia. How did your upbringing there influence you? I think the turning point for me, uh, Hank, was uh, as a kid growing up, on a farm which was both a beef and dairy property in this country. My father turned around to me one day when he was sitting on a horse next to me and sitting on a little horse, a pony. And he said, have you made up your mind, Kev? And to which I thought, what do you mean, Dad? I was about nine years old. He said, no, the big decision in life. And I said, Dad, I don't know what you mean. He said, are you going to have a future in beef or dairy? Um, and it was... Uh, it was kind of that point, <laughs> given that my mother had been feeding me books about the world and God knows whatever else, I decided that a career in Australian animal husbandry was not for me uh, and that I wanted to do something else. So, uh, so I started reading about the world, including countries like uh, America and China. And, and uh, in a town of a few hundred people, uh, you have to let your imagination run right because there's not much else going. <laughs> so, uh, but that's kind of how it happened. It's funny, I grew up on a small farm and I spent a lot of time not just milking cows, but mucking out stalls. And, you know, I learned pig manure smelled a lot worse than horse manure. You know, I, I like certain aspects of it, but I didn't want to be a farmer. So to talk about your interest in China and how did it get to the point where you immersed yourself in the language, the history, the culture, the politics, just amazing how deep you've dug. How, where, did, where did that come from? Well, I think uh, because um, it's a funny thing coming from more isolated parts of the world, perhaps where you grew up and where I grew up, um, Hank, is that you develop an instinctive interest in the rest of the world, which in those days you couldn't see. So reading a lot, but I put it down to my mother, actually. Neither my father nor my mother had ever really finished what you would call in America elementary school. Uh, they were both children of the Depression and uh, not much by way of educational opportunity, but they were deeply self-educated, as was the trend of the time. So my mother would feed me books. I remember her giving me a book one day on archaeology, and I was uh, looking at all these classical building structures. And the last two pages, having danced our way through Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, Greece, uh, Rome, etc., last two pages was on China. And I looked at these roofs, you know, on Chinese temples, and I thought to myself, I like that. That's kind of different. <laughs> so then a few years later, I remember 
as a kid, junior high school, sitting in my study bedroom, working away on something. My mother came in. My father had died in the meantime. He uh, was killed in an accident when I was a kid. And uh, she handed me the day's newspaper. And I would have been 13, I suppose, at the time. And it was China enters United Nations. Okay, front page. And then she handed that to me and said, this will change the world. And uh, you should learn about this. So by the time I finished high school and frankly, having no idea what I wanted to do in life, in a country town, your biggest aspiration was to become a bank clerk or clerk, as you would say there, <laughs> and uh, maybe a school teacher. I uh, then uh, just kind of took out my thumb, hitched my way around Australia, met a whole bunch of interesting people and thought to myself, I think I need to go to university in the Australian National University in Canberra and learn this language and about this country. And it was the best place to do Chinese language and Chinese history in our country at the time. So five years of classical Chinese, five years of modern Chinese, five years of Chinese history. So that's kind of how it all came about. Wow. Yeah, so very different. When I was growing up on the farm, my aspiration was to go to Canada and fish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. So my interest came about a little bit later. But so you then immersed yourself and you really, you know, you are a true expert in history, the culture, you know. And then so how did you then get interested in foreign affairs and government service? Well, it's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, going to university in Canberra, which is a couple of thousand miles away from where I grew up, was kind of interesting in itself. Canberra is the Australian national capital. Um, I describe it as kind of Pyongyang without the class. It's one of those invented cities like Washington, but with a, a 20th century flourish. Anyway, it was a good place to study, but I had no connection with government service at all. Someone said to me in my final university, said, you should try and join the foreign service. I remember my answer, which was, what's that? <laughs> yeah. And they said, well, you get to travel and do a whole lot of interesting stuff. And I said, okay, that sounds good. I've never traveled before. And so I began reading about it. So then I just applied and did the entrance exam. And um, you'll, you'll enjoy this, Hank. To do the entrance exam in the Australian Foreign Service, you have to go and do interviews as well. So I had to go and hire my first suit in my life. And so uh, at the age of about 21 or 22, and I went to a suit hire shop and I got a blue one and a gray one, yeah. three piece suit to make me look respectable. <laughs> Cost me $20 a suit to hire for the day. I remember paying it. <laughs> so I went to the exams and to my great shock and surprise, I actually um, did well. And they um, recruited me into the Australian Foreign Service, which is a great training ground in public policy. Yeah, it sure is. And so then, you know, the Foreign Service, which is a career track, you know, in the U.S. it's a civil service career track. But so it's not very often you hear of someone who goes into the Foreign Service becomes a prime minister. So talk about your experience in Australian politics and how your career unfolded. I don't, maybe your mother whispered that in your ear too, but how did that come about? No, you're right. Um, my mother would always discourage me from having any interest in politics. Her eternal refrain, and of course she was right, is that politics is a dirty game. And um, I'm sure it's a very clean game in America, but um, down under, because we're a criminal colony uh, of the British, it's uh, always been, you know, a little more tawdry. So we, we take Tammany Hall and Cubitt down here. But I think what happened was this. Um, I remember having done a number of diplomatic postings, the last of which was uh, Beijing and our embassy there where I was uh, responsible for our analysis of Chinese politics and the Chinese economy in the lead up to Tiananmen. This is the period I'm talking about, Yeah, in 89. You were there during Tiananmen too, weren't you? Well, actually uh, what happened was uh, my posting had finished by then, but I'd gone back and I was there in a private capacity, but oh, okay. I was in Tiananmen Square literally until about five or six days before the tanks moved in. So I met all the students and I wandered around the square. And because I speak Chinese, I was speaking to all the democracy activists as well. So I, uh, I have deeply impressed memories of uh, those days, uh, deeply impressed. Okay, anyway, go uh, back to your, you know, your transition to deciding you wanted to run for prime minister. <laughs> well, um, in the United States State Department, you have this institution called the Planning Staff or the Planning Bureau, policy planners. 
Uh, I was in the Australian equivalent when I got back, and I remember doing this huge paper for our then foreign minister on uh, what Gorbachev would mean for um, China and strategic policy in East Asia. And it took me about three months to write this thing. And I got a note back eventually from the Australian foreign minister at the time, which had two words on it, good work and tick. And I thought, that's it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's what happened when I then decided to go and do something different. So to become elected to the Australian House of Representatives, which is how you end up being prime minister, you really got to go back to your state of origin, uh, which in my case is Queensland, where I grew up. And so I went uh, and uh, took a job with um, the leader of the Australian Labor Party in the state of Queensland. We then won the state election, having been out of office for 32 years before that. I learned the rough and tumble of organisational politics and uh, community politics, learned something about politics. And finally, uh, to answer your question, decided that I could probably cut it and then eventually put my hand up for being a candidate for the House of Representatives. So and then I got myself elected. And then you went up from there to uh, be prime minister. Now, Kevin, you know, I've spent time with a lot of strong leaders and they come in different sexes, shapes, sizes, different strengths and weaknesses. But they invariably have one quality, which you have, which is intellectual curiosity. And you also, you've just been all over the world. So you, you spent a lot of time in the U.S. And, you know, I found you to be a keen observer of America. Now, we've just got through the messiest presidential election cycle in modern history. How surprised have you been by recent American politics? And then how will this affect Biden's ability to lead? Yeah, I've often uh, toyed with the idea, Hank, of trying to pen a book, given I've lived in America for the last five years, entitled De Tocqueville Revisited and uh, Reflections of a Peripatetic Australian, something like that. Because, I mean, I have a deep affection for the United States. I think you know that. And I've spent a lot of time in the country. In fact, I've lived in America longer than I've lived in any other country. And someone who's been active in our own democratic politics, I understand something of the travails you've been through and the structural forces that have been at work within America domestically around questions of equality and equality and race and the rest. So I, I don't approach this from some purist kind of neophyte perspective. So you've been through a really rough time. I think though, had the American body politic gone into the polling booth for the November 2020 presidential elections and re-elected Trump, then the world would have shook its head and concluded that America had decided to retreat permanently into itself. So for the rest of the world, including your friends and allies around the world, this was a very important election, not for the usual sort of publicly stated reasons, but for the private views of many of us who have worked in chanceries and governments and foreign ministries around Asia and around Europe, wanting to know whether the American body politic still wanted to be part of the world and lead the world. And so for all of us, and I've worked closely with Republicans and Democrats in the past, and I don't have a particularly sharp partisan view of domestic American politics at all, even though I'm from the center left of my own country. But Trump was right out there. And so therefore, there was this huge sigh of relief around Asia and around Europe when the American people voted the way in which they did. We know it's not going to be easy. We understand all of that. But in terms of the American people saying on balance, we still want to be in the world, connected with the world, leading the world and leading in the region, our region, the Asia Pacific. This is a good thing. It's a very good outcome. So my final reflection on it would be, you know, it's a, democracies are like the political equivalent of automatic stabilizers in an economy. In our democratic capitalist system, we've got exchange rates which act as automatic stabilizers. And by and large, when you've got liberalized exchange rates in open economies, they work and they stabilize our economies. Well, our electoral system does that in our politics. So you've been to hell and back in the last four years, but the stabilizers have kicked in and the American people have decided on a new course and your friends and allies think this is, as we'd say in Australia, a bloody good thing. So looking at the Biden administration, we know one of the changes will be the climate change and combating that will be a key part of his agenda and climate diplomacy will be a big part of what he does overseas. Now, as prime minister, I remember when you were prime minister and I was treasury secretary, talking about climate change, you were a powerful 
advocate for action on climate change in a country where it wasn't always easy to be an advocate. So how do you think about the challenge posed by climate change and what can be done to make our global agreements and institutions better suited to address the challenge? Well, I'm glad you raised this one, Hank, because it's a public policy passion of mine and I know of yours. And frankly, uh, for most of us who belong to the mainstream traditions, uh, political traditions of our major democracies. And you're right, I come from a part of Australia, which is traditionally as progressive on climate change politics as the great state of Arkansas in the, the United States, uh, somewhere between Arkansas and Alabama is kind of where I grew up. Yeah. And, uh, and so being a, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a tricky business, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> But um, so I understand domestic political constraints, but as you know, and I know, the global environment in which we're working has also changed over the last four years. Two big things I think have happened, which point to the future and give me some basis for optimism. One is what we've all done through combination of public policy and the sheer power of our entrepreneurs and innovators to bring down the unit price of renewable energy. This is a big game changing phenomenon. The second big mega trend, in my judgment, has been the decision by the Chinese not to become reluctant camp followers, but active participants in global climate change action. And um, the Chinese haven't done that because they are in love with America or they're in love with Europe or they're in love with the rest of the world. They've done it because they're creatures of science and they've worked out the domestic science for themselves that unless China acts nationally on climate to bring down greenhouse gas emissions and does so collaboratively globally, then um, China's mid-century dreams for the China dream for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people gets this huge exocet in the side of the ship and it's called climate change impact. Drought, flood, extreme weather events, food security problems, internal migration shifts, etc. So having the Chinese now actively on board is reflected in the unfolding documents of the 14th five-year plan for 2020-2025, and importantly, Xi Jinping's commitment for net carbon neutrality by 2060, puts us in a radically different place than where we were even four or five years ago when we signed Paris. Biden's lined up on carbon neutrality mid-century. I know the Senate could be a problem. The Europeans have already been there. The Japanese under Prime Minister Suga have pronounced the same for the third largest economy in the world. The Republic of Korea has as well. 70% of the global economy is heading in this direction. So does it solve the problem for the future? No, but to go to the final point you asked, which is how does it work? You know, all the countries I've just mentioned are in the G20. If I was President Biden, I would be harnessing the G20 in the next six months to take this on as a combined G20 enterprise and to use that to crack open what needs to be done at the next conference of the parties at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Glasgow. So you and I see this exactly the same, that if you get the major economies, you've essentially got it done. And we need to go further. We need to have a structure that goes beyond the voluntary targets and it's got some teeth and it has real incentives. But let's, so let's, you got to China and you mentioned the world on climate change is very different than existed four or five years ago. And, and you've written that uh, any return to a pre-2017 world of America strategic engagement with Beijing is no longer politically tenable. The world has changed. We've got a different China, we've got a different America, we've got a different world. Why? Why did you write this? Well, I think uh, three things had changed, uh, Hank. Uh, one is the Chinese being ultimately a party of uh, Marxist-Leninists analyzed power. That's how they got into power in the first place in 49, by winning an armed struggle. They are keen students of power and strategic power, military power, economic power, and technological power. And so what's happened over the last four to five years is the balance of power has continued to shift bit by bit in China's direction. And perhaps in terms of China's better on balance management of the COVID crisis domestically than the rest of the democratic world, that uh, shift in China's direction will accelerate. And I think the second dynamic at work is the uh, political personality of Xi Jinping, who you know and I know quite well. We've dealt with him, we've met him in one form or another, 
and individually. Xi Jinping is no ordinary Chinese political leader, that is, in the tradition of strategic patience, caution, and moving quietly in a crab walk towards a position over time. For the last six or seven years, the Chinese entire foreign policy, national security policy, and economic policy establishment has had to adjust to a guy who says, we're going to accelerate the assertion of China's influence and power and interests and values in the world. And that's why the second factor, which is a product of the first and the changing balance of power, is why China's, um, as it were, instruments of power have rubbed up hard against all of us over the last four to five years. And it began before that as well. And so I think the third factor as to why it's impossible to return to the status quo ante has been um, this um, ambiguity about where America itself wanted now to go. Now, the ambiguity has been resolved with the election of the Biden administration, but the full uh, contours of its national China strategy have yet to be revealed. What's my best punt? I think, though they may not use this word, the term that I've used, and you've contributed immensely to this debate yourself, Hank, the term that I've used is managed strategic competition. But that's different to unmanaged strategic competition, which basically is like a, a roller coaster ride which could run off the rails at any time. Managed strategic composition is made up of strategic red lines on questions like Taiwan and the South China Sea, competition open across foreign policy, the economy, and human rights, collaboration in other domains, such as climate and probably still global financial management through the G20, given the debt burden that's rolling down the railway tracks towards all of us, given the uh, COVID interventions that have occurred. And knowing the Chinese reasonably well, that sort of framework may work for them, but it is not a return to, let's call it the unconditional, uh, well, what the critics would describe as the unconditional engagement strategies of the past. Yep, and you've warned, as have a number of people, and I think you're, you're very you're wise to warn this, that the United States and China are in danger of sleepwalking into a war. Tell our listeners what you meant by this and uh, how can this be avoided? Well, Hank, you like myself are uh, interested in the economy, you're also interested in history. And um, by the way, so are our Chinese counterparts. They read a lot. They read a lot of history. One of our friends is Wang Qishan. Uh, Vice President of the country, member of the Extended Standing Committee of the Politburo. Wang loves history. So does Xi Jinping. So the reason I use the sleepwalkers analogy is that a Australian compatriot of mine, Chris Clark, wrote a seminal book in around about um, 2015 entitled The Sleepwalkers, which is how all those crazy Europeans managed to sleepwalk into a global conflict in 1914. And it traces uh, how, frankly, the common view in Europe as of uh, January of 1914 was that war was impossible. All the monarchies were related to each other. Economic globalization was running at a, a strong clip and pace back then. But what happened was with a series of competing alliances and an inability to manage crises, such as the assassination in Sarajevo, that what was a relatively small incident in the scheme of things triggered something much larger to the point where national sense of national dignitas prevented statesmen of the time from acting effectively. And so my analogy with that is, um, and so I wrote in a piece in Foreign Affairs a few months ago, beware the guns of August in Asia. And the guns of August in Asia, referring, of course, to Tuckman's great book on the outbreak of the First World War, is conflict by accident, conflict not by strategic design, through incidents in the South China Sea and over Taiwan. And that's where the Biden administration, through the full reopening of the military to military communications channels with the Chinese People's Liberation Army, need to de-escalate at that level to prevent us from stumbling into conflict by accident. That's what I meant by the uh, analogy of sleepwalking into war. Yeah, it's a, a good analogy because, you know, so many people have said, well, you know, it's not gonna happen. China doesn't want a war. The U.S. doesn't want a war. When you look back at wars, there's never an incident. I can't think of any where the great powers intentionally got into war, wanted a war. They stumbled into it. You know, you mentioned the Chinese leaders reading. I had a conversation with Wang Xishong, the vice president of China. He told me he just finished reading A Promised Land, President Barack <laughs> Obama's book. Then telling me what he learned from it. <laughs> so let's move on. 
to another question about China. And this is the region you know so well. I've said before that decoupling is easier when you're actually a couple, you know? And so <laughs> people talk about decoupling, right? And the U.S. may decouple, but what's is the rest of the world going to decouple? But there are you know, obviously more than two players here, and the rest of Asia particularly gets a vote. Okay, how do you think America's allies in the Asia Pacific, like Australia, Japan, or South Korea, are reacting to the deteriorating U.S.-China relationship? And how do you think the region will change as a result of the U.S.-China tensions? Well, uh, you're right, um, Hank, uh, U.S.-China relations is kind of the organizing principle for um, how the rest of us in Asia and in Europe increasingly foreshadow, forecast, and plan for our futures because it's so big economically and so big militarily and now so big technologically, including, for example, the binary divides we've seen over Huawei and 5G, which is simply a harbinger of what's to come in the global technology debate slash division slash decoupling. So what do the allies want? Obviously, they don't send me an email each morning to tell me, but here is my best guess about what they want. A, they want an America back in full in the region. B, uh, what they want is an America not just militarily present in the region, but an America engaged fully economically. And that means revisiting the crazy decision not to proceed with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, engaging with other free trade agreements like what's called RCEP, the Regional Cooperative Agreement with the 15 economies of the region, but also much more broadly to, for America to understand that it's easier for the rest of the world to work with the United States in national security terms if America also has its economy fully open to its major friends and allies around the world as well. Because China, as you know, comes in the door and says, we're not going to ask anything of you up front politically, but here is a bucket load of economic opportunities for you in trade, investment and technology and co-investment. And by the way, it'd be nice if you were nicer to us over time. And uh, by the way, it, do you really need that alliance with America after all? And wouldn't it be nice if you voted for us in a few UN resolutions? So China plays the economic card hard. America believes that it doesn't need to play the economic card with its friends, partners and allies. It does. So that's the second refrain you get from the allies. And I suppose the third is this. Look, every country in the world dealing with China knows that it's dealing with a thousand pound gorilla in the front uh, living room. Okay. And the response from the friends and allies, the Germans, the French, the British and Brussels, and in Asia, a combination of the Japanese, the Koreans, the Australians, and depending on the day of the week, the Indians, uh, and certainly the Canadians, is that it's far better that we act together in our negotiations with China rather than separately. And that is a re-emphasis, therefore, on the need for multilateral engagement with China. But with China as a bunch of realists concluding that we actually have collectively region power ourselves if we're singing from the same hymn sheet. And the final thing is, if all that is possible, to go back to the core of your question, the friends and allies would be delighted through that realist mechanism if the United States and Beijing could de-escalate, not just out of the danger zone of conflict by accident that we talked about before, but also uh, take, as it were, the sharpest edge of the uh, strategic competition which is now unfolding. And the reason why the friends and allies uh, would like that to be the case is that it doesn't put them in a daily binary position of having to side with either Beijing or Washington on this issue, that issue, or the next. It's not that they wish to be duplicitous, but the danger is that if you make it binary for each of them, as I say to our friends in Beijing often, be careful if you force the friends and allies into a binary position, because they might take a decision that you really don't like. But the same logic applies to Washington as well. It sure does. And one thing I am confident of, about is that uh, the Biden administration will pursue a multilateralism and they will look to work with allies. And one thing I'll say about the Trump administration, you said Washington didn't play the economic card hard. As a matter of fact, they did. In some instances, they put tariffs right on our allies, right? <laughs> in addition to China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're wrong card. That's my yeah, point. <laughs> yeah, the, the wrong card, the wrong suit, as we might say. Now, I'm going to switch a little bit to Australia, because 
many Americans are aware the U.S.-China relations are worsening, but they might not realize how quickly the China-Australia relationship is deteriorating. And China seems to really have taken their gloves off with Australia. Talk about what's happening from your perch in Australia. What's behind the current escalation of tensions and why should we care here in America? Well, it's a great question. And uh, Hank, um, it's Australia this year. It was Canada last year and it'll be someone else next year. And if you look at the punitive application of um, Chinese tariffs against countries with whom it has a political disagreement, there is a, a long history of this. If you go back to China banning the export of uh, rare earths to Japan in 2013, the actions against the Norwegians uh, over Norwegian salmon when they gave the Nobel Peace Prize to a Chinese dissident called Liu Xiaobo, current tensions with the Swedes. So in other words, this is not just an Australia problem. Right. It's an ally, friends and allies, because the Swedes are technically not allies. So therefore, why should it matter to America what happens? I think if you're concerned about the solidarity of your alliances and uh, partnerships around the world, I think we need to have a general intelligent approach of all for one, one for all, because I know our Chinese friends very well. There's a saying in Chinese, which is called Sha Yi Jing Bai, which is kill one to warn a hundred. And uh, that's the Chinese principle. I've heard kill the chickens to scare the monkeys. Kill a chicken to scare them. That's another, <laughs> yes. So, uh, so, and that's the Chinese uh, organizing principle for its domestic criminal justice system. But it's also an organizing principle for foreign policy dealing with, shall we say, lesser powers. It's been around for a while. So the counter proof point needs to be put by America, if it's serious about its allies, that America will not stand idly by while that happens. But on the intrinsics of the Australia dispute, part of it is because the current conservative government of Australia in its response to the Trump administration's handling of the China relationship, to use uh, my own analogy, was somewhat more Catholic than the Pope. And that is, uh, was always uh, somewhat, um, shall we say, overreaching in its level of public, political and declaratory enthusiasm for Trump administration positions. Uh, anything from the South China Sea to Taiwan, to human rights considerations in Xinjiang, to the trade war and to um, other binary differences between Washington and Beijing. I think there's a second factor as well, which relates to the first, which is the Australian Conservative government has always liked to use the megaphone on the China question because uh, its internal political calculus in Australia, perhaps like in America, is that it pays a certain political dividend in terms of being seen to be hairy chested and dealing with Beijing. Of course, uh, you can't do so without cost and consequences. So my overall argument is, as Biden and the administration now seek to restabilize the relationship with Beijing, as I think the Chinese are interested in doing themselves with Washington, that a key message for Washington to Xi Jinping's administration is, restabilization is not just for us, it's with our principal allies as well. And if that occurs, then we move into a zone where China's outstanding complaints against Australia can be returned to the diplomatic negotiating table internally rather than using megaphones. And the Australian government at that point would uh, ideally become a little quieter in its own diplomacy. If it doesn't, then we're going to have a full-blown test case in the World Trade Organization, Australia v. China, with all countries required to take a position on whether China has violated international trade law in its current raft of punitive tariffs. So I'm now going to switch to the immediate for you. So you're president and CEO of the Asia Society. Tell our listeners briefly what the Asia Society is and what it does and what you're hoping to achieve as the new leader. Yeah, well, it's a great American institution. It was founded by John D. Rockefeller III before I was born, way back in the 50s. And uh, it was set up by him at the height of the Cold War and barely three years out of the Korean War against the Chinese and the North Korean communists by Rockefeller in order to build bridges between the United States and Asia, including China. And so it began as a, essentially a cultural institution. And that is in the era of the Cold War, how do we use cultural exchanges and artistic exchanges and educational exchanges, and then eventually political exchanges between the various uh, leaders of Asia and the United States uh, to build bridges. 
and it used a, a multitude of mechanisms to do that, not just with China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, India, and the rest. Roll the clock on 60 or 70 years. Uh, we now have a network of 13, 14, or 15 centers around the US and around Asia. And our mission statement today, Hank, is this. One, when a whole lot of people are running around the world blowing up bridges, we go back in as kind of like a quiet team of uh, field engineers trying to build the bridges back. That's one of our mission statements. And we try to be creative about that. It's not just culture, it's policy and it's dialogue. And a lot of it's below the radar, including work we've done over the last two years of the Trump administration with the knowledge of both administrations. Uh, the second is not just building bridges, but frankly, also being, as it were, the originator of policy ideas of how we break log jams between countries. And so uh, we've done a lot of work below the radar on the US-China trade war. The last 12 months, we've done a lot of work between American and Chinese leaders on climate against the contingency that a Democrat administration would be elected and the two sides would need to hit the ground running on climate and other work that uh, we're engaged in as well. So it's not just passive bridge building, it's active proposals for how we solve problems. I'm in the business of creative problem solving, a bit like you, my friend. Yeah, we can all stand on our own bully pulpits and scream and holler. It might make us feel better for half an hour. It doesn't fix a damn thing. I'm into the problem fixing business and I hope to use the Asia Society for that purpose for the period that I'm running the show. And you know, the only way you can be a problem solver is do what you do. Listen to both sides, compromise, not be an ideologue, figure that sometimes half a loaf is better than a whole loaf. And, uh, or someone said to me the other day, this person was talking about himself, but he said, I'm a troubleshooter, not a troublemaker. <laughs> that's true. And that's and a, it's, a, it's a big difference, you know. It's, uh... There's a big, big difference. <laughs> so, and sometimes, you know, being a troublemaker internationally is good politics domestically. And so that's where, the, that's where the tension comes about. So one last question for you. Look into your crystal ball. What will US-China relations look like over the next five or 10 years? And how do you see China's role in the world changing over that same time? What China wants to do over the next 10 years is become the world's largest economy as GDP measured, measured by market exchange rates. And given the COVID impact, that may well occur. Question mark on the future direction of China's domestic economic model and some problems in terms of China's private economy direction and the concern of Chinese private business leaders about their future. And for those of us who've looked carefully, for example, at the ant financial float debacle recently, there are questions about um, the Chinese domestic economic model. But where they want to be is the world's largest economy. And by 2030, they also want to be the recognized peer competitor of the United States uh, militarily in East Asia, but not globally. And thirdly, they wish to have become a, a peer competitor with the United States in all branches of technology. And that's consistent with not just what we saw in their 2015 blueprint on Made in China 2025, it's also reflected in the early drafting of the 14th five-year plan, which takes them through both to 2025 and in a longer shot through the 2035. And I think the final element of where they want to be, uh, Hank, is this. Xi Jinping, as you know, is not about to walk away anytime soon. He is a fierce internal political operator. He's launched an internal party rectification campaign in China itself uh, to keep his political opponents not only on their toes, but possibly in jail. And his aspiration is to be China's paramount leader through to, in my judgment, 2032, 2035, thereabouts. In other words, we need to, as a world, lock onto the idea that Xi Jinping will be a leader of comparable duration to Deng and prior to that Mao. Will they succeed in all of this? That's the other key element of your question. On the balance of probabilities, I think if the Biden administration has the decade uh, to work and with a moderately cooperative Congress, moderately cooperative Congress, in my judgment, America has every capacity to give China a run for its money. 
America often its domestic discourse underplays its inherent national strengths, particularly in technology and the formidable qualities of the American military. But to do it, Hank, America for the first time will need not as just a nice afterthought, but a part of its rolling operational strategy to harness the, its principal allies in a coordinated strategy for dealing with China. Otherwise, America as a single nation state will not have the capacity to do that. So given those variables uh, and given the predisposition of the Biden administration, if Lady Luck shines on them just a little, you never know. By the end of the decade, this could be a much more contested space than China dreams of. And for climate to finish on a matter near and dear to both our hearts, I'm actually medium term optimistic that we may have started to turn the corner on this in geopolitics and in real energy policy. Huge distance to travel. Paris only took us at best one third of the way. But you know something? I think if it's of yours and others around the world, I think we're starting to build a critical mass of momentum now. So whatever the geopolitical outcome between the US and China is concerned, the basic survival instincts of both countries and ecologies and civilizations may enable us by 2030 to say, you know something, we actually managed to avoid a total planetary bullet. So Kevin, that's a terrific optimistic note to end on. And I'm gonna end with another because I have a really high regard for the Asia Society and the role they're playing. And uh, Kevin, your voice is one that is respected in the US, in China, in Asia, in Europe and around the world. And so I am very confident about the Asia Society looking forward and, and I think you will, as you've done everything else you've done, so you'll figure out how to make it even better and more effective. And let me tell you, it's gonna be needed. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks for having me on, um, Hank. And thanks for my continuing affiliation with the Paulson Institute in the great city of Chicago, which I understand is a large city in a state called Illinois, somewhere in America. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.